Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Zago. I'm the Director of Programming at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. Uh, tonight, it's a great pleasure to have our Latinx Film and Media Association uh, co-present this screening alongside Outside the Box Office and Shudder. It's a, a screening of the Shudder original film, La Llorona, followed by a live Q&A with writer, director, producer, editor, Jairo Bustamante, and producer, Gustavo Mateo. Uh, the film was the winner of the 2019 Venice Days and an official selection at the Toronto International Film Festival and Sundance 2020. Uh, for those of you who are watching this uh, screening, you are also welcome to go take a look at it on Shutter if you have that platform. The film runs 97 minutes and I'll screen share it directly through this webinar. Uh, for those of you who would rather just go to Shutter to watch it, uh, just plan on being back around uh, 740. Um, and I hope that you all uh, will join us for the conversation to follow. So thank you very much and enjoy the film. Welcome back. Um, thank you all so much for joining us for this live Q&A. Um, I'd like to welcome up our, our special guests, but I am gonna have to rename them. Uh, so let's bring them on. We have writer, director, producer, editor, Jairo Bustamante and we have producer Gustavo Mateo. And um, let me see if I've got this right. Uh, so, okay, sorry. So Jairo, you're, you're wearing the green shirt, right? Yes. Okay, cool. I'm just gonna quickly redo this because you can't. I, I'm the Guillermo wearing the green. We are all Guillermo. Yes. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I wanted to play the, uh, the whole credits because the song was so beautiful and uh, it really is sort of, I, I, did, I also wanted everyone to have a moment to sort of decompress uh, cool. because this film does deal with a lot of um, very real trauma. Um, so I, I'm really fascinated by the ability for horror to communicate stories of national trauma. And I think the best horror does this. You know, it, it really is a, it is a set of tools for communicating tragedy and um, really uh, difficult things that societies often have a hard time telling each other, uh, except through the use of a sort of genre, um, genre language. And mm -hmm. so I thought we could start there, which is telling the story of the genocide that happened in Guatemala through the use of, uh, you know, a sort of magical realism mixed with horror iconography. What, what was the original, I, I guess, uh, intention and idea that sparked this? Oh, well, I'm sorry, the question. The, the question is, the decision to tell a story about uh, this. Yeah, I understand the question, but I'm just wonder, wondering if Gustavo starts or starts or if I start. Oh, I, either, I mean, uh, you wrote the script, so feel free to jump in. So, you know, the, at the beginning, it was a, a kind of, um, of a strategy. We wanted to, in, in Guatemala, it's very complicated to talk about uh, the genocide and talk about the war in general. So we wanted to to abort that topic, um, and in a way, just costume the the message with this um, horror film shape, just to packaging it in a. Uh, in a way to, to, to give, to bring the message behind uh, and there. But after, it was really only the beginning. After that, uh, horror movies start being really justified by all the other things that we wanted to tell in the film. So we wanted, when you are talking about genocide, I think the best way to do that is using horror because it's so, so horrific that you cannot use other things. 
And after that, we discovered that when you are using oral gender, in a way, it's easier to abort some kind of topics, very deep, hard, and dark, like that one, because the audience is more open to feel and more open to, to, to accept that you will present. In a drama, people are a little bit more like uh, defending themselves and defending their, 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 their feelings. But in, in, in horror, people are really there, wanted to, to, wanted to you presenting them feelings and new sensations. So I think it was at the end of, um, a very um, good decision to do that in, in, in that language. And uh, uh, does it also reach a larger audience that way? Gustavo, do you want to continue? Yeah, of course. Uh, yes, we believe that also, well, we actually did a study before this third film, and we realized that Guatemala, Guatemala's biggest uh, box office movie was a horror movie. Mm -hmm. So we realized that people were very... Huh? And superheroes. And superheroes, <laughs> yeah. So uh, we, we realized that people were very driven to, to the gender. So uh, I think we believe it made people, because also as Latin Americans, we have something very like natural with magical realism because we, it's part of our culture. La Llorona is also part of our culture. So it's, it's something that people would identify, will feel identified. So people will like to see it. And then when they see the movie, they will find out there's a message behind it that it's more deep and more dark and more horrifying than the horror itself. Mm -hmm. So we believe it, it reached like a bigger audience that way. So we've screened at USC several documentaries uh, about the trials, about the people who have disappeared, the people who were murdered in Guatemala. But when you move from a documentary, which you know, may not be seen by very many people into something that's scripted and, and you know, uh, cast and shot with a certain production value. Um, that, that really seems like a turning point in a, you know, when a culture is trying to explain to itself uh, what has happened in its past. Um, and I'm curious to know if you're, uh, this, you might not, you might not know, but if, if there was a growing kind of discussion, discussion after some of the uh, documentaries came out that really addressed this in terms of the injustices and the, the, the courts vacating sentences and things like that. I, I guess my question is, was, what was the context for being able to tell this story and had it been, had that dialogue started with documentary films coming out? Uh, Guatemala is a very, very complicated country about if you want to talk about human rights and or social rights or, or independent rights. And we continue living in, in that kind of, we don't, we don't have anymore a dictator, but we continue having a kind of dictator system because, because we never really cut that. And there is a lot of people defending that. And so even to, with, maybe Gustavo knows better the story because I, wa I wasn't in Guatemala at that time, but there is a very nice movement, a, a festival in Guatemala talking about, uh, it's a document documentary festival in Guatemala talking about human rights. And, and in a moment they were canceled because the messages was too much real in a way. Yeah, it's Memoria, Memoria, Verdad y Justicia. It's a film festival that it's documentary and they try to uh, like recover all of the memory and history that our country is trying to like not look back. So we live this, this 36 year war that people couldn't speak uh, out about these topics. 
So now what this film festival tries is to like to recover all of those memories and, and put it on the public for the new generations that I'm like myself, I'm part of a, that new generation that is not scared anymore to talk about it. So uh, that was the context of, of the script also. And we had the great uh, honor also to, to show on the, on the movie some parts when, when there, there's a scene where she's looking at the TV and those scenes are actually from a documentary called Cuando las Montañas Tiemblan from Pamela Yates. Mm -hmm. uh, and she was like a, a very great of, of giving us that, that material so we can put it also as a context on the story. Um, before we talk about the production, I wanted to ask because often when you're talking about something that still can be very raw, you have parts of society that, you know, maybe the children of, the grandchildren of, people who were complicit, as represented in the film, um, and also people from a political party that may have supported actions uh, leading to, to the, the atrocities. So when being confronted by that, I'm curious how um, Guatemalan society sort of uh, uh, responded to this film. If there were people who continue to deny the existence of these crimes happening, and if that then led into a discourse about the film, you know, either being, uh, 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 on the one hand, a, a real representation of what happened, or uh, people who are continuing to maintain the lie that's covered this up for so many years. Oh, that's so true. That exists um, until now, and I think it will exist for a long time, that's the, the sad thing. But you know, I, when, I, when we start uh, working on, on that film, it was because we wanted to talk about the three worst insults that Guatemalan people use to discriminate between our, ourselves. And the, third thing, the first insult is Indio, who means indigenous people. And we know that in Guatemala, there is a majority who are indigenous so that's the proof that we are not proud about us and we are not loving us and we are not respecting us the second insult is homosexual and and the, the real insult is hueco who means whole and it's used for men homosexuals and and more than just being an, an, an homophobic insult is the, the real meaning is if you are a man and you are an homosexual, you are a little bit more, you are deciding to be a little bit more feminine. And if you are deciding to be a little bit more feminine, you are becoming less. So in, in a way, it's a very, very strong, machist and misogynic insult. And the third insult is communist. And communist, in a way, is, it, means enemy so the and in, in the beginning when we were under completely under the um, united states influence to us the enemy was the communist after that with the time passing the insult changed a little bit and there is not more communist real communists like enemies but it what each enemy is calling um each enemy for the state, I mean, uh, for the Guatemalan state, is, is called communist. And right now, the most dangerous enemies for all that people who were in the power at that time are people defending human rights. Mm -hmm. So that kind of people are the communists today. So, and, we are in so, and, and that people are insulting on the streets. So that's continued to be um, real. Is Ernesto based off of a specific person or is he an amalgam of the power structure at the time? Uh, Ernesto? Oh, sorry. The, um, uh, Enrique. Enrique, sorry. Okay. Gustavo, can I say what? Well, what Jairo, what Jairo wanted to do with, with, the, with the character of Enrique was of course that physically it has a resemblance of, of the dictator Efraín Ríos Montt, which is the Guatemalan dictator. 
But what I don't want it to do more than just like doing a portrait of, of that dictator was also to like recover memories and, and, and actions of a lot of dictators from Latin America. So he is not only uh, a portrait of Efrain Riolmont, but also of a lot of dictators in Latin America. So that's something very interesting that also happened when the movie started to be distributed because a lot of people from different parts of Latin America felt identified with this character. And even though he, he appears and he looks, uh, has like a, like a look very similar, uh, Jairo wrote it to be like a mix of different, of different characters in, in the historical context. Tell us a little bit about the, the mythology of La, La, uh, Llorona in uh, Guatemala. What, what, what things about it did you decide you were gonna put into the script um, specifically, I mean, the the uh, uh, th there was a um, another horror film that came out last year, an American horror film uh, that I think was using the La Llorona myth or mythology for um, uh, much less noble purposes. Uh, so I'm curious if you can delineate a little bit about uh, the importance in Guatemalan culture. Oh, yeah, La Llorona is very important in whole. Latin America, but I think the, she's more important in Mesoamerica, means part of Central America and Mexico. And, and I, don't, I never understood why La Llorona is so important if La Llorona is a very misogynistic legend, because it's always a woman crying because a man quit her. And because that man quit her, she's able to to kill her kids, so she became some matricide. And, and in some other version, she is a woman who was abandoned by a man. So after that, she decided to 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 have kids with another man, and this first man come back, and so she is dirty because she had kids with another, and she had to be punished. So it's really a misogynistic legend. And we decide to change that and take La Llorona and transform it in, um, and say maybe she can cry because a uh, more relevant thing as a, uh, that a man. And we decided a little bit, have this approach saying La Llorona is our motherland, cry because their kids are disparate in, in that war. And, and that was the beginning. And after that, we decided to, to present La Llorona like, uh, like a very, very elegant um, soul. So I don't like La Llorona like, like I saw it in, in movies before because it's always a kind of a monster, you know, always. A, and, and we were, looking for an inspiration and we, this, we, we just remember Dracula uh, with this Dracula when Dracula is so elegant and so nice it's like it's a kind of a prank, prince and so we decided to, to, to make a Girona like a Mayan princess and, and so that is a little bit the, the mix what, the, what we made with La Girona. Um, t tell us a little bit about your work together because, you know, we don't get a lot of films out of Guatemala um, and most of the films I feel like that are distributed here are documentaries. So it was very exciting to see this come through. Um, I, I, I'm curious if you could just give us a little bit of a sense of the, the moment right now in, in cinema production in Guatemala and the sorts of films that you know, you guys are, are able to produce and how, you know, how well they're traveling outside of uh, Latin America? Well, I think Jairo with, there's a, there's a very uh, interesting uh, movement right now with cinema in Guatemala and in Central America itself. So I think it, uh, there, there's, there are a lot of stories in Guatemala that are like very well kept because of the, 
the, the same civil war that we had, people couldn't express themselves. So there are a lot of like tons of stories that are there just waiting for somebody to tell them. And Haida started with this work with Ishkanul that was released in 2015. And I think it was one of the first Guatemalan films that like traveled the world and like were very well exhibit and like people were talking about it. So I think that that on that time, uh, Guatemala was put on the world cinema map. So uh, when Jairo wanted to distribute uh, Ishkanul in Guatemala, that's when we met and we started collaborating together in the next two films that are Tremors and now La Llorona. And what Jairo wanted to do with the production company here in Guatemala was uh, not only uh, making movies, but also making movies that had like a social sense and using cinema as a form of, uh, to denounce through cinema and to have something uh, to teach and also to, to talk about something that was very important and, and issues that had to be addressed. And that's how La Casa de Producción started. And also with, a, with an idea of, of creating a, an industry in Guatemala that it's right now non-existent. So what uh, La Casa de Producción and our work is doing is like, trying to to make more films with a certain period of time because with with La Llorona and Tremors we released those two in the same year so that's something that never happened before in Guatemala so I think uh, we are like moving forward to that to that point of producing more and not only more but with great quality and also with something to that we want to say not only entertainment itself. Shudder does a really phenomenal job of distributing international horror <clears throat> that often has a component to it that addresses social issues, national identity issues, um, and often, you know, sort of expresses cultures that we don't get to see very often in cinema here. Uh, though this film is really so much more than, than, than a genre film, and I'm curious to know if, uh, your, as you've traveled the world with this movie, um, how far outside of the realm of horror uh, do, you, do you find it being sort of widely seen and, and uh, appreciated? It's very strange, no? Because the film has these two parts. So there is people loving um, art movies that they say, Oh, I really appreciate this little bit of horror in the movie, uh, but it's a political film and it's an art film. Uh, and, and after that, when we talk with people who love horror, they say, oh, I really appreciate that you put a little bit of political in your film. So um, that's nice. There is some people more, um, I want to say dramatic, but I, uh, that they say that is not a, um, an horror movie or that is not an, an art film. Uh, but I think that's the I think about that kind of, of projects because they are really using different languages to, to, to bring a message. So I think we will continue playing with that. Um, tell us a little bit about the casting. Uh, was it difficult to find your lead actress? I'm not particularly, uh, unfortunately, aware of uh, many actors out of Guatemala. Quieres ir vos? Eh, si quieres, os. Hacemos uno uno. Va. Um, well, Jairo did knew like he already when he was writing the script. He knew he wanted to work with Maria Mercedes. Maria Mercedes is uh, like one of Jairo's muses because she has worked with him since Ishkanul. Uh, she had no experience on cinema before until she met Jairo. And she just sent a picture. <laughs> <laughs> because she's a great friend also of La Casa de Producción and Jairo and her career like exploded after Ishkanul. And, and a lot of things beautiful happened with, with her as a Mayan actress. So she, he already know that he already knew that he wanted to work with her, and also with Maria Telon that she also is starring in Ishkanul, 
And it was, it was very interesting because Jairo, there, there are no actors, uh, movie actors in Guatemala, or there's no acting school for cinema in Guatemala. So what Jairo started since Ishkanul was to create this kind of um, program when he, where he works with the actors before the films, that it's very intense. They work like three months before, six months before. Uh, so he um, had like a very good training with Ishkanul and also he had a very good training with Tremors. So what he did in, with La Llorona was kind of like a mix between some actors from Ishkanul and some actors from Tremors. And he welcomed to, to actors that are uh, Enrique Monteverde, which is Julio Diaz, and Carmen, which is Margarita Kenefic, that they are both uh, like very important um, th uh, actors from theater in Guatemala. So they had no experience in cinema, but Jairo brought them to cinema and also did a training with them. So it was kind of like a mix of, of talent that Guatemala already had and people from Ishkanul and people from Tremors. Mm. But and the case really, was very quickly. Yeah, we really like this idea of family or group or people working together because uh, even that actors that we form in, in La Casa de Producción we, we didn't want to have them just like a one-shot actor. So we decided to, to become their agents and start looking for other projects for them. And, and, and there is some opportunities and there is some projects that we really um, did. So we're really happy because at the end, that's, that's that we call industry is that, you know. Tell us a little bit about the the extras who represent the victims of the genocide, because uh, I would assume, just based on the the scale of what happened during the Civil War, that the the people that you cast just for crowd scenes must have had uh, real violence in their family, in their lives. And uh, um, I mean, was that the case? Was filming this uh, in any way? Uh, form of catharsis or a form of, of, of trauma. I, you know, I, there have been other examples in cinema where the filmmaker has brought together people who have a very real connection to this story. Um, and in, you know, in some cases that, uh, that's been a, a process of healing and in some cases, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's also sort of brought things back up that had been repressed. I'm curious if you had any experience with uh, the, the people that were in, you know, there to represent the, the, the missing people. And you know, the, I think the most, the most challenging uh, fact in the film was play with a kind of a balance that we build. So we wanted to have this balance saying, if you put one thing in our gender film, you have to put one other thing in realism and history facts. So, Following that, we decided to, to then call actors to make all the extras that I, I don't like to call them extras because they are more like supporter actors or actors, so I don't know what, what call them, but they, they really play like, like actors in, in the film, not just like extras. And so, we decided to, to have that people really involved to, to make that scenes real. So we, we call people who really live that kind of, of catastrophes or continue fighting against that kind of, of, of power abuses. And so Gustavo uh, can continue to tell you all the, all the people who wanted to join the project. And, and for us, it was one of the most emoting uh, scenes to shoot because we were really working with real emotions. Yeah, and the scenes where uh, they are coming out of the, of the ambulance, those were the most uh, emotional scenes for, for a lot of the supportive actors because um, they, there were 
all from different organizations that are uh, sons and granddaughters and grand uh, uh, that are looking for their missing people from the war in Guatemala and that are still fighting for for the rights uh, of a lot of people that lost a lot of uh, a lot of families. So we were playing with something very hard for people because we we didn't do it like as a theoretical thing, but at the end, it's it, it ended it ended up being like that because they had they didn't have the opportunity to tell the dictator a lot of things, but in that moment when they were playing the act, the, the actors and they were screaming at him and they were manifesting themselves, there was something going on inside them that was very strong, and at the end when Haido like said cut and like everybody stopped. We had to take some time because there were people crying and there were people like that were very, very anger. And like, uh, there were some like um, stories with Julio, Julito, we call him the, the actor because he's very sweet. He's a very sweet guy. And people were like really hating in that time. And they were pushing very hard. And you can see it on that scene, it's very strong. And at the end, I think, it was some something beautiful happened with the energy of that scene because people that had that didn't have the the opportunity to have a closing they they were having it as that moment in in the scene so for a lot of people they were very thankful of actually like having the opportunity to manifest to somebody that was representing somebody else what they felt inside so it was very beautiful to see it and also very powerful after the, the, the sentence was vacated, I'm curious to know if there have been further, there's been further progress towards any real justice. All cases continue. There is people continue to fight against that. And there is, uh, there is a lot of, a lot. There is some, some, some process um, uh, that indigenous people, one and but that one who was the most important because it was the most iconic um at the end it was they stopped the the, the, the the end of the process and and i think that is dramatic because not just because the justice didn't make the work but it's 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 sad because when you are a victim and you are not and and your people no re, no recognize your your situation you are victimized again and again each time when somebody says uh, it's not true it's not true and you are just um, just coming to to give your your testimony because you are paid you are suffering again. Uh, there's no recognos reconocimiento. What do you say that? And, and so I I think we we continue hurting us. And you know it's very strange because people think that if you made a film like that, you will hurt our country. And 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 the only things to do is still in silence. Mm. And. I'm just noticing that we have a lot of questions. So I want to do something that we've been um, that we've been doing where instead of just reading out the questions, we actually invite the person over to turn their video on and ask the question live. Um, so that there's proof that it's not just the three of us out there. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, let, let me call on um, for everyone that's out there. Uh, I'm going to call on you and welcome you over as a panelist. You don't have to turn on your video. You're welcome to just use your microphone, but if you are uh, comfortable turning your video on, please do. Uh, it would be very nice to see your face. Um, so let's call on uh, Ismael Viegas, and uh, I'll just go ahead and move you over. And then I'll also start putting an order to the people we're going to call on in the chat so that you have a sense of when you're going to get called on.
Bueno, bueno, ¿me escuchan? Hello, can you hear me? Sí, yes. Eh, pues, hola, buenas tardes, Jairo y Gustavo, pues, muchas gracias por, el, por los dos por acompañarnos aquí en el evento. Um, uh, so, just, a, I have a quick question. Um, well, I have many, many questions, but I'll, I'll keep it, I'll keep it uh, uh, short. Um, so, uh, thinking about um, when you're writing this film, um, uh, when you write, do you start with the story already finished, uh, like mapped in your mind and only write the dialogue or is it vice versa? Or how did you uh, tackle the writing process for something that is um, so injected with uh, political background, but uh, in the disguise of a, of a horror film and uh, a mythological, um, I don't know, myth mythological uh, aspects like La, La Llorona. Oh, I, I'm very classic in my way to work. So I start with a logline and follow with a synopsis and really, really, really classic in that way. And, and when we had the, the treatment that we were happy reading it, and I, I jumped to the, to the script with dialogue with dialogues i decide to start looking for in people around me people who defend the fact that our dictators because we had a lot are heroes and i start uh, um, trying to understand how they talk and and i use a lot of real uh, sentences coming from that kind of people and and I made the dialogues um, thanks to them in, in a big part of the, of, of the film. All the families is built like that. Mel, you did have several questions. I don't know if you wanted to ask a couple others. I can go after other people. I'd, I'd, uh, I don't want to steal all of their time. OK, we'll, we'll bring you back. All right, so we'll go to uh, Isabel Ramirez next. All right, Isabel, you're on with us. Uh, I, sorry, I was trying to unmute my microphone. Uh, Hi, Gustavo and Jairo. Um, I'm really happy to see that um, uh, Latin American writers are making a uh, screen. So I saw, my, my question is, uh, I saw Roberta Menchu in the film. So did she w uh, help you with the historical background? Did she support you in some way to make, uh, make, a, make the, the film too? Um, well, Rigoberta Menchu was a very important piece on the historical context of, of, the, of the trial. And she's very good friends with Jairo and she was very supportive of Ishkanul when Ishkanul was running for, it was, was on the running for the Oscars. And since then she was very interested to see how Jairo works with, what, with film as a form of activism because she's an activist an activist too. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Haido talked to her that, that he was uh, working on this film, she was very interested. And Haido invited her to be part of that, of that scene specifically because she was very an important piece on, on, that, on, that, uh, on that work and the trials and everything. So for her, it was very important to also be part of it. And she has also been uh, very supportive now that it's the distribution of the film to, to show what this other face of, of what happened could look like. So she's very, she's very happy to be, to be just uh, like spreading the word with, her, with also her activism work. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, Andrea Garcia 
you're already with us on the panel side. Hi, buenas noches, um, Gustavo Jairo. Uh, such a pleasure to have you. Um, the question that I had was um, going back to that discussion about genre. Um, so in telling this history about mass atrocities um, in, in Guatemala, did you ever consider maybe a different, um, going a different, in a different direction, a different route? I know it was um, sort of came to the decision through some research, but did you ever consider, um, or now do you ever like consider um, having gone in a different direction? Um, well, I think it's, I think what Heidel, Heidel had was very like, um, had the idea very well put on since, since he was writing, uh, and he, it was very difficult to portrait what happened actually with the, the atrocities and everything. So he was more interested to see how was it felt to have all of that all, all of that thing in your shoulders with the family inside the house so because it's like the part you don't get to see and like um so he wanted to explore more of what la llorona could do inside that uh that that part that family that house that dictator that family and uh that's how the legend of La Llorona came like very in a good way because she is also the representation of water. So she could like like get inside that house with humidity and like with uh, the water running from different parts and like with the pool. So that was more like the, the direction he wanted to follow. And, and it was very like um, from the beginning was thought that way. Uh, okay, let's welcome on Allison Avila. Uh, hi, hi guys. Um, don't know if you guys can hear me right now. Um, I, um, Heido, I'm a huge fan. I've been uh, following your creative vision for a while now, and Gustavo, it's really nice to meet you. Um, I'm a Guatemalan American, very proud of that, and uh, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, trying to make it here in, in, in Hollywood as a TV exec. It's, it's, uh, I'm currently an assistant, excuse me. <clears throat> but I'm really interested in um, finding more Guatemalan talent. That's what I, what, what I would like to do, um, is find um, uh, more uh, Guatemalan directors and, and writers and, and actors and producers and whatnot. And I just want to know, like, where should I start? Like, where do I go? Because it's very, I think there's very much like, um, uh, it's, it's difficult, it's difficult, uh, to make the connection. Oh, you know, I think follow the, the director is a good way because at the end we work, the industry really grow up in these uh, last years. And, and I think we are able now to, to start big projects and that's may make feel very proud. And but I think you can you can follow the the directors because we know all the talents and and if I have if I if I don't know is one of them other director can can give you contacts but there is another things that next uh, last year we made a um, guide uh, with the in what who is the um, tourist institute in Guatemala. Uh, to put inside the contact of all the people working in cinema industry, so you can find it in line. Uh, maybe, maybe Gustavo, you can send it the name of inguat.com. It's very easy, and and you can find the guide there. Thank you so much. Welcome, and and you can write us after that if you want to. You, if you need some something specific specifically, we can help you. Okay, we have uh, John McMahon. John, if you're out there.
you might need to turn up your volume. Okay. Uh, all right, it doesn't seem like we're getting John's audio. So let's welcome over Leona. And Leona, you just need to unmute yourself uh, if you want, and you're welcome to turn on your video. Hello. Hi, Jairo. So, um, so I, my original question, I think, was already answered about uh, how to represent uh, horror in the, um, and how it's represented through La Llorona and through um, the genocide. But another thing that I was wondering was, what was the reasoning behind choosing Carmen to uh, live the experiences of Alma and those flashback sequences? Um, that's something that uh, very, um, there were very visceral uh, sequences that spoke a lot. Oh, we, we want to talk about three different kinds of four different kinds of generation in the film. So um, the first generation is represented by Carmen and the general, and that's a generation when they are in this side of the history, they are really, they are really not em em empathic. They, they are not feeling any kind of good um, emotions about the victims. So I decided to, to make with her the hard work. So I say that to make that character empathic about the victims of the conflict, we, she needs um, a ghost coming and possess her and make her, make her feel that, that the, the victims felt. So that was the decision for why Carmen became that character who made this kind of very nice art. And I think at the end, the character is very complete. And I really lo love that, that character in the film. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. And uh, thank you for also sharing about the stories of the supporting actors. That, that was one of the questions I had. Very beautiful. And I'm glad that they were able to experience that themselves through this um, film. Thank you. Okay, we have John, and then after John, we'll take one last question from uh, Mercedes Cayetano. So John, take it away. Hello, uh, yeah, sorry, I was muted earlier. But uh, yeah, I had lived in Guatemala, I guess it was about 1889, no, 1989, 1990. And I thought you captured uh, the kind of the lingering anxiety between the class divides. And uh, even though I didn't know a lot about Guatemalan history, nor the Civil War actually at the time, uh, there was a very perceptible prejudice against uh, the native Mayans and so on. I'm wondering if um, you and your crew uh, had to do research to kind of convey that period, or was it so ingrained in your family history. Can you talk about that? It was a mix of both. In in a way, there that that part of the of the of my people history is, you know, is a kind of a, a very very dark, heavy and and sad heritage that we have, and and we live with that each day. And, and we have to be very careful because it's more comfortable to take the place of the people who are discriminating uh, uh, Mayan people because in that, in that side, um, you have more power and you are safe. <laughs> but, um, but when you start talking about that kind of, of, of topics, you have to make research um, even if you know very well the, 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 the subject, because, because 
there is victim in, in both sides and because there is a lot of people who wanted to, to change the story. So in a way we have that kind of responsibility to be in short time, in 90 minutes, very, very punch and very, um, and very specific and, and just pray to make the audience feel a little bit that we are feeling for a long time. I have a, another question, if I may, and it has to be. I'm sorry, we, we have to wrap up, so I can't give you time for a follow-up. I'm so sorry. I did bring on one last person, Mercedes Cayetano. Um, uh, so we'll wrap this up for the night, and I am sorry, John. Sure. Um, I'm sorry. 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 I'
So thank you, Shudder, and, and thank you to the audience to be with us until the end. And thank you, everybody. And if, if you can uh, share the news and tell people that it's available in the United States, that would be amazing so more people can see it and like talk about these topics that are also very important for us. Thanks again, and good night, everyone. Thank you.